assembly lines, production lines, lines that mean jobs for Northeast Ohioans. For years, the Illuminating Company has helped bring new businesses here with thousands of new jobs and paychecks. And CEI people are still fighting for more. So when you think about it, our power lines deliver a lot more than electricity. We're working to keep you working. For several years now, we've been peering through knot holes, stretching our necks over high fences, raising our eyes skywards and peering into gulfs, trying to get an idea of the heights and depth, the width and breadth of the terminal development. Still, its immensities and complexities tax our capacity for appreciation and understanding. Sounds like a description of the Tower City complex and its recent construction, doesn't it? But the paragraph I just read was written by Carl Robbins in 1930, 60 years ago. The story of the building of the original Terminal Tower complex is a big deal. It's worth hearing. In the early part of this century, progress was measured by the number of belching smokestacks a city had, by the number of passenger and freight trains that pounded through track mazes, by heavy industry, steel, coal, shipping. That was the measure of a city, and Cleveland had lots of muscle. But it was showing signs of wear and tear. Oh, if you drove down the Euclid Avenue of that day, you'd be impressed by what was then known as Millionaire's Row, a group of stately homes built by some of Cleveland's most important industrialists. But Public Square, the heart of the city, was flanked to the south and west by a seedy collection of grimy buildings collectively known as the Haymarket, a district made up of poultry, produce, and commission houses. It swarmed with horses and wagons and trucks, the sidewalks were filled with marketeers, and the sound of chickens, and geese, and hawkers of produce was everywhere. The area also attracted the attention of two men that would change the face of Cleveland forever, O.P. and M.J. Van Swearingen. It made their fortunes as well. O.P. Van Swearingen, Horace Paxton, and his brother, M.J. Mantis James, were born near Worcester, Ohio in 1879 and 1881, respectively. With five children altogether and money in short supply, the brothers supplemented the family income by delivering newspapers in the area of what is now known as Shaker Heights. Their memories of this pleasant countryside that had been abandoned by the Shaker religious community by this time stayed with them. The Shaker Group placed the land for sale in 1889, and the 1,366 acres sold to a local real estate firm for $316,000. O.P. and M.J. left school and worked for Bradley Chemical. The boys, inseparable friends, soon left, however, and bought property in Lakewood. But this venture quickly ended in foreclosure on the properties. But the business sense that eventually made them the talk of the American business community surfaced, and they started to develop North Park Boulevard, an area they knew well, and then decided to expand into Fairmont Boulevard. But it quickly became obvious that they needed a public transportation system to lure buyers into the beautiful area. The Van Swearingens, soon nicknamed by the press the Vans, convinced the head of the Cleveland Railroad system, John Stanley, to build the Fairmont Boulevard streetcar line. This assured the success of their development, and in 1905, at the ripe old age of 26 and 24, they took an option on the land that once belonged to the Shakers. In 1906, they picked up the option and bought the land for a million dollars. They then put together plans for a model community, and Shaker Heights was born. It became a national symbol of a prosperous, planned city. Everything seemed to be going along very well, but lots were not selling as quickly as they would have liked. And it was soon evident that people wanted public transportation to the vital downtown of Cleveland. The vans planned a rapid transit system to carry people. But this seemingly simple plan launched them into the railroad business. 
They needed access to 10 miles of rail to downtown Cleveland, but that route meant that they had to cross the Nickel Plate Railroad Lines, one of the many major railroads serving Cleveland. The nickel plate, in poor financial condition, was asking for more money for the right-of-way than the vans wanted to pay. So they did what was becoming easier and easier for them. They put investors together and bought the railroad, all 513 miles of it. This made the Shaker Rapid Line a reality. In the meantime, Cleveland was growing rapidly. In the 20 years between 1910 and 1930, its population jumped from 638,000 to 1,202,000. This meant an enormous growth in rail service and a subsequent outgrowing of the old rail station, which had a sign nearby that said, don't judge this city by this station, or words to that effect. So the need for a new Union Station was already being talked about. And a new plan was hatching in the fertile minds of the Van Swerigen brothers. As early as 1912, a company representing the Vans leased its first piece of land at the southwest corner of Public Square. And in the greatest possible secrecy, large amounts of land were acquired in the area surrounding that quadrant. The Vans continued to take over railroads. They soon had control of the Chesapeake and Ohio, the Erie, Pear Marquette, and the Wheeling and Lake Erie Railroads, 27,000 miles of trackage in all. Their master plan to house their railroads and planned office complex was taking shape. To make the shift of Union terminals and to build their complex required taking the issue to the people. The first word of the venture surfaced in 1918. The public liked what it heard, and on January 6, 1919, ratified the plan for a new Union station by popular referendum. The original plan called for a much more modest building, one that had a small tower. It also called for the demolition of over 2,200 buildings and the relocation of 15,000 people from the 104 acres that made up the area. It was a monumental proposal. Streets with names like Champlain Avenue, Columbus, Howe, and Long Avenues, amongst others, were destined to disappear. Major buildings, such as the Central Police Station, were to be raised but others, such as brothels, poultry dealers, and dumpy hotels, were to go with it. In 1920, the task was begun, and a pall of dust hung over the area as demolition went on and on and on. After several years of construction, the Van Swearingen's announced that they were going to extend the tower to 52 stories. This put the project into the huge category. Retaining walls were built to provide for a clear railroad access. But the key to the project, and the one that would cause much argument in later years, was the construction of 22 bridges on which the complex was to be built, and which would carry rerouted traffic. The Hotel Cleveland was the first structure to appear on the site in 1918, followed by the Higby Department Store in 1931. In 1934, the last of the complex was completed cost one hundred and seventy nine million dollars the terminal tower was opened in 1928 and it topped out at 708 feet it was anchored to a foundation that went down over 200 feet to bedrock and many of the supports to be used for future expansion were used as supports for the new tower city center complex inside the tower the vans had a suite built a house within the tower. It was paneled with rich Sherwood forest wood. It can only be described as elegant. It was a place where the men could stay when they didn't want to travel to their home in Shaker Heights. The whole complex actually consisted of eight connected structures. Terminal Tower, the Cleveland Union Station, Hotel Cleveland, Higby's Department Store, the Midland Bank Building, the Medical Arts Building, the Builders' Exchange, and the Post Office. The quality of each building and the attention to detail is amazing. And even after 60 years, each is uniquely beautiful. The Cleveland Union Terminal was the first underground station in the country. 
and at that time the largest group of integrated buildings under one management in the world. With more square footage than Grand Central Station in New York City and 35 acres of track in the train yard, it was staggering in its size and complexity. When the time came for a formal opening ceremony in 1930, the reserved Van Swearingen's didn't attend. Instead, they had a quiet meal at home. But clouds were on the horizon. The brothers survived the crash of 1929 in reasonable shape, but they continued to buy railroads using questionable financing. As the depression deepened, the railroad stock plummeted and in 1935 they were faced with bankruptcy. A brief attempt to regain control failed, and MJ became ill several months later and died suddenly of heart disease. OP never got over the shock of his beloved brother's death, and in less than a year he too died, and the chapter on the Van Swearingen brothers ended. They left their imprint on Cleveland, however, and left it a better place. Wandering through the artifacts taken from the old terminal tower are Bob Backman and Dick Cook. Both men worked for the Cleveland Union Terminal Railroad. Bob was a train dispatcher, responsible for the movement of hundreds of trains every day. And Dick was a tower operator and a photographer who loved trains and took beautiful shots of trains that are now extinct. In those days, uh, you didn't have areas like this with tracks and no trains. There was an awful lot of train traffic. My memory is of the old public square and uh, along Superior Street, and they kind of just started to dig up and tear it down. And they, uh, and they kept working on it. It was a long time being built. It was really a big building to watch it go up. We never had anything that big around here. And then to have the trains running right into the public square way, that, uh, that was really something. I think the average Clevelander was very proud of the terminal tower and the, the news station. That was the way to travel. And uh, the tower, 708 feet tall, was uh, the tallest building uh, west of New York City, including Chicago at that time. The terminal was real busy. There's no getting away from it. All the tracks were occupied and, and uh, all the time, and it was, uh, well, it was like a big, it was like a big toy, and that's the way it operated from our office. It was the largest single unit interlocking tower in the world, had 576 levers in it, and there were four men that controlled it. You weren't aware of any dull times during the day. It was constant movement. One of the features of the railway system was the switching of passenger trains using electric engines from Lindale in the west and Collinwood in the east to the terminal tower. It took a steam engine a lot longer to pull a train out of the terminal, but they, they did not allow uh, steam engines underneath the terminal because all that smoke would come up into the uh, concourse and into the Higbee's and the office buildings and so on. It was fascinating, I guess is the best word you could use it. I mean, to get on those electrics and start up and go, and no noise and all that kind of stuff. It uh, eliminated all the, the bad features of the steam. Steam was romance, but this was progress. During the Second World War, when I was younger, uh, my mother used to haul me down to uh, Public Square on the, oh, the streetcars, CTS, to go Christmas shopping. We'd always wind up at Fred Harvey's for lunch. Uh, I can remember the USO during the war, and the Korean War was a big active uh, thing on the main concourse, which is now part of the Tower City facilities. Many Clevelanders have memories of downtown and of the Terminal Tower, but few documented them, like Jim Holtz. While still a relatively young man, Jim started taking pictures with an old camera when he was 10 years old, progressing to motion pictures when he was 12. He bought a movie camera with the profits from his paper route, and he proceeded to take pictures of trains, trains, and more trains. His love for them came at an early age. 
Well, I started out with the traditional uh, train at Christmas time when I was about three years old. I became a, somewhat of a fanatic on railroading, a model railroader today, a, a steam railroad fan of the late 40s and early 50s through and including about 1958. In retrospect, in hindsight, as an adult, I look back at it and it was just a, a melting pot of major railroads. It was an industrial town. It had a lot of population base in the city of Cleveland. If you were going to travel anywhere, you came to the Cleveland Union Terminal. It was a transition period also, uh, from the heyday of the World War II steam engines into the uh, dieselization of the, both the passenger and the freight trains. So, so it was a, from a reminiscing standpoint, it was an ideal time to be alive if you were interested in railroads. Jim Holtz was able to document a rare event with his little camera. A steam engine exiting Union Terminal, pulling a passenger train. I have a picture of a New York Central Hudson-class locomotive pulling a uh, passenger train westbound out of Cleveland towards Lindale, uh, up the ascending grade. With At the rear end, that I didn't realize it at the time, was a Cleveland Union Terminal diesel switcher helping to push the train up the hill. So it was like, it's a rare thing. It's a, something that was never supposed to be and not supposed to have been done. to be down on the concourse uh, when the New York Yankees came in for the a fairly famous uh, Labor Day doubleheader where I think uh, the stadium was sold out and they had standing room only. It's over 80,000 people I know, probably the largest baseball crowd in the last 35 or 40 years. I saw many of the famous players of the time come up to concourse, even shook hands with one of them. I can't recall which one, but uh, Allie Reynolds, uh, Mickey Mantle, uh, Yogi Berra, um, famous players of the time, uh, contemporaries of the Bob Fellers and the uh, Early Winds and, and some of the other Cleveland Indians at the time. Uh, every day, every time I was down there, I was always amazed as a child and as a teen and then uh, later as a young adult, I was always amazed at the number of people and uh, the variety of uh, activities going on. People in uniform uh, during the Korean War and the Second World War, uh, USO activities, uh, people shopping, Christmas time. Uh, the main concourse itself uh, was cavernous and echoey. Uh, you'd hear the train calls being called all aboard, uh, please. Uh, people lined up at the top of the steps to go down to the platform, which was on the lower, lower course. Lansing Vale is like many who experienced the Terminal Tower during his youth and never forgot the experience. Uh, I remember it when it was brand spanking new. Uh, I don't remember it being built, but uh, I remember taking trains in it and going downtown to just to see the terminal and to take a look at all the new stores that were built in the terminal and the rest of it. It, uh, it was very spectacular when it opened. At times when you were going to take a train, I think the excitement when you're younger was, was accentuated by the anticipation of this train ride. And to arrive at the terminal and the beginning of this experience as you got out of your car, went into this very large concourse, and then suddenly you're over at the gate and waiting for the train and you suddenly hear this rumble starting to come in and the and and the uh, the big electric you can uh, sort of a hum as it went by uh, and this rumble of the train and you finally heard the thing uh, slow down and came to its stop and then finally uh, you probably just faintly heard the conductor say all aboard and he would step up and a few moments later why the train would just slowly move out of the station. And uh, as you moved out into the light, uh, if it was daytime, of course in the darkness at night, uh, we were talking about how Cleveland looked as you were coming in or out, uh, and any semblance between that and what is called first class on an airline today is purely in name only. Trolley lines, crowds of people milling around, the New York Yankees walking through the terminal to catch their train, crowds of servicemen going to war, 
It was a place of sound, of smell, and an energy that was soon to disappear. The era of the steam engine and the deluxe passenger train is over. The Union Station is, in a way, a memorial to that era. But people still recall those cavernous stations with the sounds of trains leaving for exotic places like Chicago, Schenectady, New York, Kansas City, and all points west. It was the way to travel. But the pace was slower then, and life was a little simpler. The years since the completion of the original terminal tower and Union Station have been filled with exhilarating highs and excruciating lows for Cleveland. Its massive industrial base served it well over various wars. Its sports teams achieved the highest goals, and its cultural institutions were exalted worldwide. But somewhere along the line, things began to go wrong. Massive urban renewal plans failed to materialize. Neighborhoods became polarized, and people fled to the suburbs. Racial tensions increased. And then began a series of events that were almost farcical. A minor fire on the Cuyahoga River created an image that hung like a weight around the necks of Clevelanders. A mayor's hair caught on fire. Sports teams fell on hard days. Finally, the abyss was reached when the city tipped into default. Public ridicule seemed complete. By 1980, the bottom of the pit had been reached. But like a family tree with strong roots that has suffered superficial blight, Cleveland began its comeback. A new mayor brought a new climate of cooperation and stability. Businessmen who never lost the faith started to plan for new development. Not the least of these were the representatives of the Ratner family. The chairman of the board of the parent Forest City Enterprises is Max Ratner. He talks about his first encounter with Cleveland. We came here in the year 1920. We came from Bialystok, Poland, a family of 10. Eight of us together with father and mother. We came in the United States with 18 dollars, 10 of us. The first thing that we started at that time in the 20s, there were no garages because there were very few cars. And nobody had a garage in their backyard. And at that time, of course, we used to build a garage, for example, I'll never forget it, for $59, complete. There was no terminal town. I remember in 1923, I think it, my mother took me for uh, downtown. And uh, right where the terminal tower stands, there was a flower shop. And I bought it for 35 cents a pot of flower, a pot of flowers. Max calls building in downtown Cleveland, quote, one of his biggest dreams, unquote. That was the biggest dream that I always looked at downtown, and we never could afford to build anything downtown. It was a very sad time for Cleveland. I had been the health director and the community development director in the middle 70s. And in all of that time, in one year, 1976, there were only 17 building permits for new houses taken out in the city of Cleveland. I had run for Congress and lost as a Republican uh, candidate. And after that, my uh, brother said to me that I had spent most of my adult life in some type of social service, and that really the ultimate goal for anyone would be to be able to create jobs for others, and that the company and the family was starting on a project that would indeed do that. That was in 1980. At that time, Forest City and U.S. Realty had bought what was the train station, the lower concourse, U.S. Realty having owned the terminal tower, and so Forest City and U.S. Realty went into partners, and they had started to imagine what this project might be. We live in Cleveland, and this was an opportunity to do something in the city we lived in that we hoped would be significant in terms of what it could contribute to the city and to the community. It was an opportunity. 
Uh, there was an existing building that was underutilized that had significant value, significant asset value. It had a wonderful location uh, that couldn't be duplicated anywhere else in the city of Cleveland. It was in the middle of all the transportation in the city. It was the unique rapid station in downtown. It was located right in the middle of the, right between the two major downtown department stores. And as an opportunity, as a retail and mixed-use opportunity, its location was unique in the city of Cleveland. So it was both a real estate opportunity and it was an opportunity to work within a city that we were all committed to. I think the first breakthrough for this project uh, was when Albert and I went to see George Voinovich, who had just been elected mayor. And you know, when you're in the development field, you learn a whole new alphabet. Uh, UMTA, UDAG, HUD. We went to see him uh, about two things. One was the possibility of a UDAG grant, Urban Development Action Grants, which the government had for just this type of project that would indeed be creating grants. And also because Tower City is built on bridges. For 50 years, the developers and the city had fought about fixing the bridges. Nobody could really designate or recognize who owned those streets. When we went to see George Voinovich and took his credit, he looked at us, he said, you know, I'm not going to spend any time arguing about who owns the bridges. I think what we're going to do is work together and find the funds to help rebuild the bridges. And we were very grateful for his help, and indeed he did give us a lot of help. It was not only George Voinovich, it was the Congress people from this area. So the help and the encouragement that we got from the political factors, from the county, from the state, it was as if suddenly everyone had decided that we'd had enough of this negative image. And there was something even beyond that. It's, we're Clevelanders. We're very grateful uh, to be living here, uh, to have had the benefits of people living in this particular area. We wanted to give something back. I looked at it and I kept saying it was like the pyramids, building the pyramids. Uh, only I think this was even more complicated than building the pyramids. Uh, the building, the actual construction, was done by Forest City Enterprises Division of Construction. They're very competent. Many of the people there had worked on large pro projects around the world. We had set a target date for opening. Uh, developers always have to do that. Well, in life, you have to set goals. We discovered that um, the goal was very ambitious because everything takes longer than you think it's going to take. Like that seems to be about one of the rules of life. It always is harder and takes longer. The team was made up of a group of energetic, strong-willed people who came to Cleveland with experience in tackling major projects all over the world. The senior project executive is Alan Ellett. I marched on this site on, uh, well, I think it was Wednesday morning, the 12th of July last year, which we were still putting the steel work up on the steam concourse, skylight concourse it's now called, and uh, we were still hadn't completed the demolition. And uh, I would say that I've built many billions of dollars in the United States and throughout the world, and this is probably the toughest assignment I've taken on in my life. The project director for the Tower City Complex is Doug Lund. He was working in Tehran when asked to come to Cleveland to look at the site. He'd been involved in a major development in England similar to Tower City, which had become one of the leading shopping centers in Europe. He saw a lot of promise in this project. When I, when I came to the project and walked down the ramps, the very first thing I saw was the rapid transit facility. And of course, you've got to understand, I was a near fight to Cleveland. I didn't really know what the project was all about. But I saw this rapid transit facility, and I'd already seen the bus, the bus stations out on Public Square. And they were the very items, the public transportation aspect of the project that excited me the most. The old Union Terminal Complex gave the engineers challenges. It was difficult to find ways to bring daylight in and open up what was essentially designed as a subterranean space. The original space was really subterranean. You were beneath the bridges, and we had to find a way of bringing in daylight. 
uh, and opening up the project so that people could see out and really understood, understand where they are. That was one of, the, one of the immediate challenges that was set before us. The man responsible for the sequencing and scheduling for the project is Fred Greedham, manager of planning and logistics. When approached by Doug Lund to come to Cleveland to work on the Tower City Center project, he went to the library to find out about the city. It was a shock. My knowledge of American geography is, is I'm ashamed to say, very limited. Um, I had to make a trip down to the local library and the town where I lived in UK to find out exactly where Cleveland was. Uh, went down with my wife, um, went to the reference part of the library and discovered that Cleveland um, was referred to as the mistake on the lake. Uh, the river had caught fire, the lake was polluted, there had been riots here, full of industry, um, all the bad things about a town you wouldn't want to go and visit, I read about. Um, and had to tell my wife that um, this was one hell of an opportunity. Fred's first impressions of the terminal tower were not exactly inspiring. Uh, of the building itself, I felt was um, in a building in decline, of a building in decline, um, almost a mausoleum kind of uh, impression I had the first time I saw it. Uh, cavernous, um, with a lot of opportunity. Much of the construction had to be done around the clock, and that posed some unusual problems. We then had a noise problem, uh, what work we done at daytime and nighttime, which didn't impact particularly lawyers in their offices. Um, the worst telephone calls always seem to come from lawyers. I am a lawyer, uh, you are disturbing me, that kind of approach. <clears throat> but all in all, they were, they were very, very fair, the adjoining owners and the um, department store people and the hotel. Uh, we had a lot of cooperation from them all, and they all realized that the intent of, of this project is to benefit downtown Cleveland, and we all worked together as a team. We don't forget Stouffer's, for example, he had to give us a piece of land. We couldn't build a building without Stouffer's. I think we're always uh, working on the, uh, the proper image of the city. And I think that, you know, probably the biggest change that has gone on in this city is the attitude of all of us. In the last 10 years, we have changed from being doubters on our city to being proud and anxious to talk about it to other cities. I think it's unfortunate that we often look at visionary people who have been out front really helping the city and we're suspicious. I mean, I think that's true of the, of the Jacobs. I think it was true originally of, uh, of the Ratner family and Art Modell. And those are the people who really have made the city with their being willing to have the courage to invest before the rest of us were. Holly Beerer is vice president, public relations. When she started with the company eight years ago, ways had to be developed to create in the minds of the decision makers a sense of confidence about the future of the Tower City complex. One of the first things we tried to do was invite the decision makers back into, into Tower City and we held a lot of functions for nonprofit organizations and a lot of benefits to try to um, encourage people to use the center and it quickly caught on. One of the main problems the marketing department encountered was the negative image that people outside of Cleveland had about the city. It was really difficult to sell Cleveland at the time. It was, the city was in default. Um, it did not enjoy a very good reputation. And so we really had to create tools that we could use, that our leasing people could use, um, to market the center. Due to the complexity of construction in this massive undertaking, the Tower City development team created a full-scale mock-up to mimic the three levels of retail stores. This was done to test the finishes, marble and terrazzo patterns, to accent and feature lighting, and to experiment with visual sight lines. So, in a dingy warehouse, a whole strip of stores was fabricated, using some of the original historical brass storefronts and marble to blend in with new features. It was refined and reworked. Dale Townsend remembers those days and some of the problems. We have uh, three different elevations, three levels. The concourse level, which is our, our lowest level. Uh, on that, uh, it, we have created here uh, our historic section using marble floors, original Tennessee pink marble, using one of the brass storefronts that was originally in the terminal tower. And we, in our intermediate level, or what we call our public square level, uh, we have many of the elegant finishes that were 
indicative of 1920s. We've got original plaster, uh, terrazzo floors, um, some brass trim work. And then we have our new level, the 80, well, the 100 level, which is uh, actually going to be the uh, street level of the office tower and the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. All the memorabilia stripped from the terminal and adjoining structures was carefully cataloged and stored in protective crates in a warehouse. The beautifully crafted brass was numbered and stored until restoration could take place. The owners have a, a much, you know, a very large concern uh, to make a, a show place. And this is going to be different than going to your local shopping mall. Uh, this is Tower City. Uh, this is the Terminal Tower. And that's, uh, that's important to them, and it's certainly important to all of us, that we be authentic, that we maintain the, the exact character of, of the marble corners and the, and the corners were that the that the, the craftsmen of the, that created this brass uh, uh, you know, didn't go to the grave with them. You know, we're going to continue it. Uh, we're going to reestablish it, and hopefully for the next 60 years, it can be appreciated again. As construction gradually geared up, management put together events designed to let the growing workforce know that they were appreciated, and that as the schedule accelerated, they were going to be asked to do a lot and under trying conditions. The fall of 1989 saw steel going up all over the place. The ballet of man on high steel was performed in what sometimes seemed like slow motion. In what looked like an updated version of Dante's Inferno, the workmen labored on. How they knew what went where was a thought that often crossed the minds of visitors. Press conferences increased in number as the news of new tenants was gradually released. An important element in the plan to attract a cross-section of retail outlets was the desire to have a group of financially sound businesses owned by women and minorities. The head of our leasing department, Emmer Corsi, who was responsible for all the leasing that took place, several years ago, came to see me and said, you know, we are not getting any application or any interest from minorities or from women. So we appointed a civic committee of uh, ministers, and there were people of all faiths, all colors, all ethnic origins, 22 of us. The city helped, the state helped, uh, many of the banks came forward. 400 people applied right off the bat. We ended up with perhaps 50. From the 50, we chose 10, which will be about 10% of all the tenants here will be minorities or women. And those that are already in the center, I, I mean, I even feel so gratified, all of us do, because they're doing so well. It was the hidden conditions and the very, very tight schedule that put a, a lot of strain on many, many people. And, uh, you know, the old adage of when the, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. The tough really got going here, and we had a tremendous crew of guys downstairs that pulled off what most people would say was the impossible. Some risky aerobatics were performed as girders for the old post office building, renamed the M.K. Ferguson Plaza, were gingerly lowered into precise slots. On November 16, 1989, in a driving snowstorm, the Ritz-Carlton Hotel was topped off in a ceremony. And just a few days later, the final piece of the arch forming the skylight concourse was put into place. Activity was increasing, and shifts were now running through the night. Workers became used to tours gliding under their riveting. And those fortunate enough to watch all the different skilled trades work saw a lot of old world pride go into the building of Tower City Center. The old brass was being restored by young men who were not even born when it was first crafted. And then it was put back in place using pictures and drawings to ensure that it was exactly the way it used to be. The tedious side of the project is typified by the cutting of giant urns by Flaviano Cenderelli, who was born in Italy and who has been carving all his life. 
Over a period of many weeks, he worried huge blocks of sandstone into beautiful urns that would be placed outside the new RTA station entrance on Prospect Avenue. But construction during a Cleveland winter wouldn't be complete without a damp cold that is driven to the bone by biting winds off of Lake Erie. There were many weeks of numbing cold when hands would stick to steel as a forgetful worker grabbed for a beam. Or there would be frightening moments as wet boots slipped on the slick steel. As the heavy construction phase was completed, the first marble arrived, packed in straw, and was put in place. The frames and outlines of stores started to take shape. It looked, to the uninitiated, like chaos. Of course it wasn't. And familiar names started to appear in stores. Press conferences continued to be held. And during this one, Disney announced plans to open their store. Critical to the success of Tower City Center is the rapid which has to move thousands of people in and out of the complex. To attract more people, a new RTA station is being built. It will have new platforms, climate-controlled waiting areas, a new Prospect Avenue entrance, and many other inducements to commuters. The decision to build this station was crucial to the project, and Ron Tober, general manager of RTA, comments. The authority had a major rapid transit station there within the complex and had had for a number of years, uh, dating back to when the, uh, the, the complex itself was a railroad terminal. And that station was in great need of repair. It hadn't been modernized or fixed up in probably 30-some years. And it was in a terrific state of disrepair. It was not a particularly pleasant environment for our customers. In terms of accessibility into Tower City, Having the rapid transit station there is a major plus. Uh, we believe that public transportation will play a major role in the future in trying to maintain a good quality of life in this community. Just five days before the grand opening was scheduled, it looked as if it would never happen. Shifts were increased. Overtime was logged in mind-bending numbers. Fatigue was evident in the eyes of everyone connected with the job. It was a grand push and only a few thought it would happen on time. We just decided as many people as it was going to take, we were going to make that March 29th opening. And I think it is a credit to the, uh, the logistics, it's a credit to the management, and a credit again to the spirit of the people involved. Albert Ratner is Forest City Enterprises president and is the one man generally given credit as the driving force behind the Tower City Center project. His constant presence in meetings, on the job, at press conferences, and on tours, is now legendary. Waving his arms at a vision which, at times, only he could see, or exhorting the troops, Albert Ratner often motivated his staff by sheer willpower. Two of Max Ratner's sons, Jim and Chuck, were keys to ensuring that the opening day deadline was met. For months, daily meetings were held to present and solve the day's most complex problems. Orchestrated by Jim and Chuck, these sessions often lasted late into the evenings. Schedules and deadlines were reviewed and re-evaluated. But one thing was certain, everyone was moving in the same direction to meet the March 29th date. With the opening ceremony just an hour away, saws were still being wielded on reluctant railings. Plaster was being applied. It would be wet, but acceptable as far as looks go for the opening. Somehow, it came together. And as the public crowded in, in one direction, proud and fatigued workers walked off the job in the other. And they weren't reluctant to let their pride in their work show. I've been working guys 17, 18 hours around the clock for the last couple of weeks. And I'll tell you what, it's really, you know, you feel proud when you look at some of these stores and see how much work you accomplished down there. What do you think about it? It's, it's great. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's great. The best thing that ever happened to Cleveland, really. We just, on phase one, we have five phases. This is phase one. We have four more phases to go. So, uh, it's good. looking real good. We're going to Disneyland after this job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> No one showed more delight than Jim Ratner at the grand opening. 
In the press release on the occasion of the grand opening of the avenue, he said, quote, we've invited all of Cleveland to take part in this special celebration with us. This is a grand opening for the entire city, and we want everyone to share in the pride and the excitement of Tower City Center. We've put the emphasis on family because Tower City Center is a place everyone, young and old alike, can enjoy. After the opening, it was like one huge carnival under glass. Millions streamed through the complex with wonder in their eyes as they took in the transformation of the old train station into a glistening marble and glass environment. Like parents 60 years before, thousands of mothers and fathers brought their children to see this extraordinary event. When I was a young woman, one wore white gloves and a hat to come downtown to know that it was a very special place. But even today, coming downtown, that trip of coming downtown heightens one's awareness, heightens one, one's energy. Life is lived forward, but understood backwards. So if we think about the 20s, uh, we begin, begin to understand there's a great parallel between the 1920s, the 1980s, and into the next century, the 90s. It's been good being here again. I'm David Burney. Thanks for watching. This presentation of the Memories and the Dream is sponsored by these Cleveland corporations.